Throughout Shakespeare, we have these fools, madmen, jugglers, gestures, clowns, delivering the real wisdom of the plot. And, and, and it, it, it's perverse to see a culture that then takes some of this Shakespearean wisdom, you know, whatever, from the canon and sort of perverts it. I mean, I remember uh, studying Shakespeare and, and uh, well, I, they gave me this quote to remember from Polonius, you know, to thine own self be true. This could be the first line of every 12-step plan or something. To thine own self be true, and it follows as the night to day, that thou cannot sin be false to any man. Of course, in the context of the play, you realize that Polonius is a bureaucrat, a politician, a windbag, a blowhard, shallow, stupid in his wisdom, is, as I said earlier, just exactly the banality of a common mind. But yet, Grade school, we teach this. See how, see how smart Shakespeare was? Yeah, he was smart enough to show that that wasn't wisdom. That kind of commonplace crap wasn't wisdom. He was that smart and more. Well, anyway, uh, Nietzsche, uh, uh, in, in search of other self description and in search of new myths to replace the dying old myths that we could as it were, participate in and perhaps enjoy an enhanced life rather than, you know, in the case of many of these uh, therapeutic approaches, uh, put an end to the struggle of subjectivity. Um... to establish a lot of what I'm saying, I think, is, um, is a simple kind of time travel experiment, which is, if you imagine beaming back anything, any music produced in the 21st century into 1994, uh, I picked 1994 deliberately because it's 20 years ago, and it's hard for some of us to accept that. that. 1994, 20 years ago. But if, if beaming it back to 1994, what would happen if people heard that music in 1994? Um, would they go, my God, this is this is inexplicable. I've never heard anything like this. This isn't even music. Um, I don't think anyone's going to do that. I don't think anyone would do that. Actually, I think the the, the, the reverse would be the case. If you beam back music from 2014 to 1994, People are going to say, you serious? This is coming from 20 years in the future. future, future. This, this doesn't sound that different from what we've got today. Um, and, and, if, and I think that's, you know, thinking of that 20 year period uh, illustrates the kind of slowing down, flattening of time that I'm referring to. Because if you think back of uh, 1994 to 1974, the, the vast sonic world that had, that had been born and died in that period. The enormous kind of series of mutations that have occurred between 74 and 1994. Or again, between 54 and, and 74. The, the speed, the rapidity, the, the, um, the, the efflorescence of, of, of different sounds, di different sensations um, that emerged in that period. Since 1994, I don't think, you know, I think that that's flattened out. It's not that nothing at all has happened, but I, I think it's hard to make the, the case that um, almost any, any, anything that, that, has, that has been produced in the 20 years subsequently was sonically unimaginable in 1994. Um, it's, you know, it's a whole series of fairly logical extrapolations of, um, of propositions of, of, of methodology that will be in place. And that part of that means then the disappearance of, of retro, or the disappearance of, of the concept of retro in the very, very um, in the very universalization of retro. Um, I mean, there's always been, as long as there's been kind of popular music, there's always been retro dimensions. That's, there's nothing new about that. Um, I think what is new about the, the current moment then is really that, the, that, that there's nothing 
the, the, the failure of any alternative to what would have previously been considered retro. Now we can ask the question retro compared to what? What is not retro now? I think that just that really, I guess, follows from what I've been arguing so far. But, um, I guess this became apparent to me in the mid 2000s. Um, which I refuse to call, call, call the noughties. Although in many ways they're a decade which deserves such a horrible name. But um, it was, you know, it was when, I, when I was walking through a walking through a shopping mall and I heard that Amy, Amy Whitehouse cover of um, uh, a Valerie um, by the indie plotters, the Zoo Tunnels. Um, and when I first heard it, in a casual listen, I thought it, I genuinely thought that this was a, a 60s record. You know, I thought that, that. So I reversed the temporality in my mind. What I, what I, you know, I, I thought that the Zootons was a cover of this 60s song. You know, it was a production by Mark Ronson, Mark Ronson, um, specialised in those kind of um, refurbished sounds of the 60s. Of course, if you listen to it closely, you, know, you realise that it's not a Nevertheless, um, that uh, that initial response sort of indicates this kind of flattening of, of, of cultural time that has occurred. So there's something which had come out um, 40 years, years later uh, could sound like you know could sound sufficiently like something from that earlier period. Um, a similar thing happened when I first heard the Arctic Monkeys, who in subsequent become even more boring. A similar thing happened when I first heard the Arctic Monkeys, <laughs> which is you know, two subsequent. You know, when I first heard the Arctic Monkeys, <laughs> which is subsequent. You know, when I first heard the Arctic Monkeys, which is subsequent. You know, when I first heard the Arctic Monkeys, which is subsequent. That's all for now, viewers. Thank you, and remember, if you're in the UK, vote Labour on December the 12th. See you on the next Theory Wave Nights. I've been Mike Watson, author of Can the Left Learn to Meme?